Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn, learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI Online account. Today, we're honored to welcome Dr. Navid Faraji for a lecture entitled, Utilizing Social Media to Heal, to Teach, to Discover. Dr. Faraji is an MSK radiologist and passionate educator at University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. He teaches the residents in their program, but is also heavily involved in educating medical students in radiologic anatomy. We're thrilled he's here today to share his expertise with us. At the end of the lecture, please join Dr. Faraji in a Q&A session where he will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Faraji, please take it from here. All right, folks, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Thank you for MRI Online and Modality um, for having me. It's great to be here, and hopefully it should be a relatively fun talk today. Um, I'm a radiologist here at University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, and um, yeah, passionate educator. So here I am educating, or at least trying to. Um, let's get started. So originally I made this lecture, I'll say, as a first year attending, and it's one of my favorite ones to share with folks. And I think it's you know, social media utilization has been something that has been, um, you know, relatively important to me in my young career so far. And I think it's a tool that is underutilized. So hopefully you will agree with me and join the party after this talk. So I was thinking to myself when I first made this, like, you know, I'm a, I'm, I was junior faculty in the department in which I work and which I trained as a resident and fellow. So all these people who I'm, you know, I've been asked to educate in this grand rounds are folks who had educated me. So some of these folks, for example, Dr. Nikhil Ramaya, he's a abdominal imager, um, uh, Dr. Donna Pletcha, who's our chair, Dr. Sheila Berlin, just a lot of well-known radiologists, who, Dr. Gilkison, who all, Dr. Young, who's our section chief in MSK, Dr. Sivit, RIP, Dr. Pospilati, Dr. Sunshine, our vice chair. So the point is, like, these are all these, you know, well-known, accomplished uh, radiologists in our department, and what do I have to teach them about, this is my sister, another radiologist, about radiology. So it seemed clear to me that, you know, while I saw myself at the time as this person, that mostly everybody probably in the audience saw me as this young um, person. So what can a person such as this teach um, some more, um, let's say, seasoned faculty? And then to me, it came to mind that, you know what, maybe utilization of social media would be a good topic to share with these folks. So um, the title of this talk is Utilization of Social Media to to Teach and to Discover, and which is the motto of our um, That's my uh, tag here on X for Twitter. And how can we use this to get promoted? So it's going to be geared towards medical students, towards residents, and also to faculty. How can we utilize I've got no relevant disclosures and, you know, the objectives here, I'm trying to promote introspection about your personal departmental goals and how you can use social media to achieve those goals. In addition, um, I'd like to understand, the, you know, to understand the various ways social media may be utilized and to highlight some resources that may assist you all in utilization of social media in this capacity. So, you know, first things first is in order to motivate you folks to, to care about what I'm talking about, it's probably important to talk about what your goals are. So as a medical student, like what are the main goals, right? You want to match into the field of radiology, which is increasingly challenging and particularly in today's day and age. And then eventually uh, you want to obtain exposure to the field of radiology. A lot of medical students don't have a lot of exposure in their curriculum to the field of radiology and social, you know, and social media may have provide an opportunity to do so. For radiology residents and fellows, you want to become competent radiologists. That's a goal. Uh, it should be a main goal and to pass the boards. You want to match into a good fellowship program and ultimately get a job. What about attendings or technologists or nurses in radiology? You want to get promoted. You want to maintain your certification, provide high quality care, as, and, you know, radiologists in general like to be right, you know. Um, so, 
being well educated can can increase your likelihood of being right when you see a case. You want to be well known to others in your department and to and to, with others in your hospital and in your specialty. And you know we want to recruit those excellent trainees and we want to increase our volumes and make the bosses happy. So we're going to talk about how social media may help all of these folks to to accomplish these goals. So here's a potato, and let's say we want to make hash browns, right? We can do it the old fashioned way, which is more laborious using one of these knives, or sometimes they make tools to help with shredding said potatoes such as this. So social media for me is like using one of these rather than doing it the old fashioned way. And so we'll talk about a little bit about how it may be useful in order to do that. So I just wanna give a scenario to help exemplify the point I'm trying to convey. So let's say there's two folks applying for the same job or for a promotion or for a grant or for a fellowship, right? One of those people has um, you know, social media presence and the other doesn't um, going back. So let's say one does, one doesn't, you're, you're interfacing with the same interviewer or the same decision maker. And if that decision maker has a pre-existing exposure to one of these applicants due to their social media following, and it's a relatively positive social media presence, that's not super controversial or, um, you know, challenging, I guess I would say it's relative positive exposure, then that person may have a little bit of an edge re relative to the other person, assuming everything else is held equal. So that's um, one scenario in which I think this can be helpful. So again, we're going to talk about this and how Twitter or now X may be a tool to to kind of emulate the a, a way to do things in a different way that may be more efficient. So a little bit of background about Twitter or X. Um, you know, at the time of this publication, 2018, there was 330 million active users. Who knows? Is that up or down by now? I guess it uh, remains to be seen. One in five U.S. adults had a Twitter or X at the time. And it's a microblogging platform where you can share your thoughts in 280 characters using videos, pictures, or GIFs, or GIFs, depends on who you ask. Um, it's for great for case presentations if you put some images in there um, and great for those with a short attention span. So each thought is called a tweet. Um, I'm assuming most folks in here know what Twitter is, so I'm going to kind of fly through here. And you can interact with other people's tweets by liking or reposting or retweeting them. So what's the utilization of social media in medicine and radiology? So this study in 2017, academic radiology, uh, in addition to this other study, 65% of physicians were using social media for professional reasons, and 85% of radiologists were using social media as of 2017. 60% of folks were using it for networking or professional purposes, and it's a small but expanding community, meaning it's a perfect time to enter. And it goes beyond the CV. It gives people an opportunity to see what you're all about, not you know just what your list of publications are, for example. And so this is a, so social media, is that a misnomer, right? Do you have to be a social or do you have to be an extroverted person to be on social media? And I guess my thought is no, because you're not really directly face-to-face -face interacting with folks that can drain your energy if you're an introverted person. The reason for this photo is because it kind of exemplifies the difference between my wife and I. I'm an extroverted person and she thinks I'm a psychopath. So, um but yeah, so I think there's a place in social media for everybody. Dependent, it doesn't matter if you're introverted or extroverted. It's just a venue by which you can share your thoughts and represent your quote unquote brand in this space. So there's this ransom survey of re reasons radiologists use uh, social media and Europe and USA in total. And most people are trying to stay informed about the latest news and developments in radiology. Others are trying to communicate with their colleagues most commonly um, and at national, international, to share and discuss interesting or difficult cases, which people do often, and increase my influence pro and promote my ideas. Just the top four um, common causes, common reasons people might use it. Um, just exemplifying those there. And also to make our profession more visible to patients, obviously radiology is a very patient facing specialty. And the more we can expose 
uh, our patients to our specialty, the more likely they are to advocate on our behalf when the time comes, if necessary. So we got some catching up to do, or at least we did at the time of this publication in 2015 in that private practices, I guess I meant in academic radiology compared to private practice radiology, there was a relative um, difference, statistically significant difference in the amount of departments on social media, um, both in LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, Twitter was not as statistically significant, but there's a discrepancy there. And so the point is we had some catching up to do. I would assume that by now this gap has been closed. So let's talk about how social media can help us to heal, which is what we wanna do as physicians, obviously. So we can stay up to date on the radiology literature. I mean, if you follow the various ACR, RSNA, uh, your favorite journal, CPDR, academic radiology, whatever it is, they tend to post uh, publications as they're being published. And it's a good opportunity for at least stay up to date on the headlines in the, in the recent publications. Additionally, we can share puzzling cases and get opinions. I love doing this because I get insight into what people are seeing throughout the world and our country. And for me to share any puzzling cases, as long as you do it in a safe and non-identifiable way, which we'll talk about. So 78% um, of radiation oncology articles were, were tweeted before the paper publication came out. So just in, you can really be ahead of the game on the cutting edge literature if you're on social media um, prior to it's even posted in paper. Um, a, a lot of radiologists are using Twitter to follow radiology news. We can connect with and educate patients, although you want to be a little bit cautious about that. So here's an example of how you can use uh, social media to stay up to date on medical literature. I mean, this was a free open source te textbook that was shared by Vivek Kalia, a, a great musculoskeletal radiologist in Texas, um, to just to share this resource with other folks um, in the world. Whoever is exposed to his social media platform would have seen this and just a good opportunity to get free open source resources. Um, and there's hashtags you can follow, like foam, FOAMRAD, free open access medical something. FOAMRAD, um, so it's just another hashtag, F-O-A-M, RAD, that you could get some free open access resources. Here's an example of an article posted by Radiology um, about breast MRI, just getting these uh, quick snippets before they are published just to expose you to what's going on in the world around you. Just another example about dual energy. This is an MSK example about how dual energy can help you to assess whether a vertebral fracture is acute or chronic because um, we can see some bone marrow edema here where we see absence of uh, bone marrow edema-like signal on this particular case with the virtual non-calcium. We can share puzzling cases. So there's an example of someone doing this. So, you know, things that you don't want to do, you don't want to say, I saw this case yesterday, for example. You don't, you want to make sure that all the image you can, you don't have any identifiable image, um, in, information on these images, right? There's no dates, there's no names, there's no birth dates, there's no locations. And anything that's a patient identifier is not present on this case. And that's how you can remain safe. 40-year-old uh, male, I mean, you could say middle-aged male if you want to be safe, but the main gist is you do not want the patient to be able to identify themselves in the images. If it's a disease entity that's so rare that they could, then you probably shouldn't have posted, or um, if you give enough information that the patient could identify themselves, you probably don't want to post it. So just feel very cognizant of that. So connecting with and educating patients. Okay, so we're, again, we're be working behind the scenes and social media offers us an opportunity to step into the light and expose the world to what we do on a daily basis. Uh, we can educate, can educate thousands of patients on medical imaging and procedures, fast MRI, cancer screening is a really important thing that we do as radiologists. And it's important for patients to know that we are the folks that are providing these services um, of the cancer screening. It's not their surgeons or their clinicians. Um, so 85% of patients are unaware that radiologists are physicians. That is a problem um, for, this is 2012, that we need to fix. And more than 80% of respondents in studies said that the person who was interpreting their exams was important or very important. So I don't think this is, I mean, this number is hopefully less than 85% now, um, but uh, it's probably still higher than we'd like it to be. And continued exposure on social media is one way that we can to educate patients about what we do. 
So market, marketing is a really important thing, right? So before you go to buy a car, for example, you see a car commercial that kind of prompts you like, oh, I really like that car, right? So before a patient goes to get their medical service, um, if we expose them to the services we provide at our institution or in our department, they may be more likely to choose our institution relative to another institution down the street, for example. Um, so we can differentiate our departments from neighboring healthcare centers. And so the concept that I described is called pre-commerce, where opinions are formed regarding products or services before the consumer actually engages with that service. And so social media is a way for us to engage in pre-commerce. And you can control your narrative, not health grades or doximity. I would encourage all of you who are on or not on social media to Google your names to see what happens. And before I created an X or a Twitter, it was like LinkedIn, doximity, things that it's difficult for patients to engage with. Anybody can give any sort of feedback um, and rate me any sort of way. Um, but at least if you have an X, it's usually the first thing that shows up on your Google um, that allows you to control the narrative. Social media sites are preferentially prioritized compared with third-party sites on Google. And there's ways, uh, breast cancer, social media, and, and lung cancer, social media, are, these are hashtags that you can engage with these patient populations. So if you were to Google my name, um, you would see that my Twitter or X is the first thing that shows up. Next is my work. And then there's probably further down some additional resources, but you know, you click on the first link and that allows patients insight into what I'm all about rather than other um, platforms determining what my narrative is. Uh, Michael Anzara is a former co-resident of mine who does not have a social media. So if you search his name, you'll see it probably a little bit changed by now, but UH hospitals where he worked and then Toledo where he went to med school, but then WebMD, healthcare for people. Like what is all this stuff? You know, it's, it's relatively nonspecific and doesn't really give a lot of information about you. So this article, um, Basically, I really liked this quote, which is radiologists must rise to the challenge and embrace social media as an opportunity to counter the false narrative, of the significance of radiologists and patient care, and the idea that AI will replace radiologists. Big topic, right? AI was all over RSNA. Also, just plug, here's my RSNA mug. Um, but yes, you know, med students are scared to go into radiology because of AI, because of other physicians kind of giving them maybe false information about AI or and some people think that AI is going to replace radiologists. That is not my impression. Um, I think that AI is going to aid us to, to increase to our output and throughput, do it in a safer way. And social media is, also, is a way for us to combat that narrative and share articles that you might publish about those things. So that was about how to heal and various numbers of ways to do that. Let's talk about how we can teach uh, an area of interest for me. Uh, so 89% of med students are using social media, 91% by radiology trainees, and it allows us to share stuff from our department, like ways that I could educate folks, articles that I publish, um, cases that I see, it gives enlightening information to prospective fellows and residents about the types of cases that we see in our department and our coursework and casework and our accomplishments. It allows mentorship opportunities. Can't tell you the amount of times I've gotten a DM or a message or from folks who would like some mentorship. And I'm happy to accommodate everybody the best that I can. Obviously, there's limitations to what one person can do, but I'm trying to do it all as much as possible. So it's ways for you to reach out to other physicians, other radiologists and geographic areas of interest for you to seek mentorship. So... And as far as sharing cool cases, again, like, so this is a way that I can show the types of cases we see in our clinical service and our radiology service. And this is a patient who had um, Rugger Jersey spine, which is indicative of uh, renal osteodystrophy. And this case was showing some atrophic kidneys, this image that you can't see unless you click on it. And then we have these nodular hypo intense areas with erosions of the acromioclavicular joint and some erosions of the greater tuberosity. And you couple these erosions and nodular things with renal osteodystrophy and renal failure. And this is uh, more likely to be uh, amyloid arthropathy with differential PBNS and giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. So quick question, what is the most effective social media that could help in more communication? I mean, I personally mostly use X for this. I don't use my 
Instagram is we have a departmental radiology and residency Instagram, but I use that. I use my own X for my own personal communications. And my Instagram is more for my own personal use. I don't use it for professional reasons. Um, that's my preference. Here's another case just showing Langerhans cell histiocytosis and then eventually, you know, spontaneous resorption after treatment. Here's another case by Dr. Harisangani at, uh, I think, somewhere in Boston, MGH maybe. Um, don't quote me on that, but showing extramedullary hematopoiesis. So folks can share the types of cases they're seeing and educate the masses on those types of cases. So, and here's some examples of mentorship and keeping connections. So this person was looking for a mentor and advice and got a bunch of um, a bunch of folks reaching out. And so I'm rising here, interest in biology. I'm looking for mentorship advice accounts. And you can see retweets, comments, things like that. Shannon Sullivan is one of our radiology residents. And I was able to get uh, to interface with her prior to her being. So this was when she was a PGY1. Before she joined our institution, we were able to interface. Um, Grace Ju, obviously, she created Rad Discord, which I highly recommend as a resource to all of you. Um, and basically, there's a way that I interfaced with her prior to even joining Rad Discord. And here's our local medical students whom I teach at the med school and just ways for me to interact with the folks locally uh, whom I teach too in Toledo. So you can see basically it's just a way for us to interface with both local trainees and in national and international trainees as educators and kind of mentor folks who are seeking mentorship and just be able to give back positively to the world. So recruiting trainees, how can we use it? So eight of 75 neuroradiology fellowships had at least one social media account. And that was in 2017, 2018. If you compare that to neurosurgery, 31 and 21 neuro, neurosurgery and neurology programs had at least one social media account. So that was um, and then only approximately 50% of NeuroRad division chiefs had one social media account, but most were on LinkedIn. So I think it's time to for these folks and to start joining the Twitter and social media in that way to X and to be a little bit more, uh, to increase our exposure to prospective applicants and trainees. Uh, and most tweets were radiology news related, not promotional about what they're doing in their department or what they're doing in their division or trying to recruit. So news articles tend to result in less engagement, some data shows, and more on this later. Women in radiology, really important topic. If we want to increase the, the number of women in radiology to be more commensurate to the amount of medical students there are, then we need to expose um, more folks to our field and hopefully capture the interest of uh, women in the, this pipeline. And one way to do that is to just show that how supportive of a community we have in the radiology community uh, for women in, uh, in radiology. So one example of how that can be accomplished is a, there are two a one hour tweet chats um, were performed um, on behalf of, I believe, I can't say for sure which, I think it was JACR, but I'm not 100% sure. And a tweet chat, what is that? That's a moderated discussion regarding a specific question or questions. And so you can use various hashtags to follow this tweet chat. And basically, it's a conversation between folks who are engaging with this timed um, and met a proctored tweet chat where questions are presented and folks can interact with those questions um, in a organized fashion. So session one garnered 472 tweets with the hashtag RadXX. 2.3 million impressions uh, were generated which is likes or any ways that someone uses or interacts with that tweet. Session two garnered 620 with 1.8 million impressions. So these are great things to participate in, to learn about um, whatever the topic is in that tweet chat, also to increase your exposure and your interest by participating in those tweet chats. Other individuals who are participating may become um, more aware of who you are and what you're all about at the same time you're learning about this topic and engaging in a meaningful way. And it's really important because if you can see it, you can be it, right? So women in radiology, if if we want to increase um, women in the field of radiology or underrepresented minorities in the field of radiology, 
if we present to the world that, hey, you know, people like you exist in our field and you can be successful and, you know, you can have a flexible, desirable life, whatever you like, whatever it is we want to say about our field, you know, putting that out for the world to see as a way to increase engagement and hopefully develop a pipeline of folks that are more interested in uh, participating in our field. And this is just an example of how we've done that in our department. Uh, Rad Discord, just a quick little segue on that. What is it? It is a platform, communication platform on Discord created by Grace Zhu, who was a University of Utah resident and now is an abdominal imager at University of Utah. And it's the first international online radiology community that promotes real-time interactions. There's various chats geared towards, subchats geared towards trainees and junior faculty. Um, there's invited lectures and board reviews for any R3s out there getting ready to study for a board. I uh, really would consider joining that, you may get exposed to these free um, board reviews. So here's an example of some, and they also have a Twitter that you could follow and some of the board reviews which were given. So here's a little article if you're interested in learning more about Intro to Rad Discord by the, on the ACR. Um, any bad experiences using social media that you have that you're aware of, not trying to be negative, but wonder what the pitfalls may be. Thanks for your time and the opportunity to learn, no problem. So honestly, I can't say that I've had a real negative experience personally. I've never been called out for posting anything incorrect. And I generally try to use, uh, I try to engage in a more positive way. Um, and I not, tend to not participate in controversial discussions or if people like disagree with what I'm posting in general, then I'm always open to being corrected. I mean, negative, like, there's no negative that I can think of. The only thing is that, you know, a lot of people want mentored and I can, you know, I try to accommodate people to the best of my ability, um, but it can be stressful in some, in some instances, depending on what else is going on in my life for one person to um, interact with so many folks, I guess. But as far as like a real professional challenge, I can't say like more than maybe somebody saying like, are you sure this is that or what else could it be? And me responding, yeah, I guess you're right. It could be this, this, or that, rather than just this. That's like the worst case scenario, but that's just part of being a radiologist and being open to learning and being corrected um, if appropriate and, and, and participating in an academic discussion. Great question. So to discover, um, let's, so we healed, we've taught, now we're gonna discover. So Twitter, um, this is all basically about research and learning things and, and promoting your own research. Um, so it provides opportunities for folks to share their own research and read the work of others. And most radiology journals have a Twitter presence. And I would advise everybody to start following those journals which you're most interested in. You can share articles to be published. How am I doing on time? 1230. Oh, I can slow it down a little bit. Let's slow it down. It's fine. Okay. Great. So we can demonstrate a link between the impact. Oh, yes, yeah. this is interesting. There has been a demonstrated link between impact factor and social media presence for radiology journals. So what is your impact factor? Um, because for me, it stands to reason that if a journal being on social media has increased the impact factor, then a person like yourself or myself who is posting their research on social media may also increase their impact and exposure, um, which essentially can increase your impact factor. So, you know, individuals don't have impact factors to my knowledge, but I think the same, you know, reasoning makes sense. So of the top 50 radiology journals per the study in 2016, only 11% had no Twitter connection. The 11 subsequently joined social media and experienced an increase in impact. And feel free to substitute X every time I say Twitter. I'm just too lazy to go back and forth, so we're not going to do that. Uh, journals with Twitter profiles had a higher impact factor than those without profiles. Mean is 3.37 versus 2.14. And a larger number of follows was correlated with a higher impact factor. So the more followers you have, the more you tweet your own stuff, the more likely you're to expose other readers to your research and perhaps you will be more impactful in, um, by broadly exposing uh, the world to your research. So social media presence increased engagement from readers. Um, as I alluded to earlier, 
and increased article access when tweeted. You know, there's a 30 day period in some journals where you get a free link to share your article for free with the world. And that's a perfect opportunity to share that link for others to read your article for free if they're not um, members or subscribers to that journal. And using personal and journal institutional Twitter accounts augmented the social media strategy. So control group 7.6 and 19 compared to 9.4 and 20.1. Not really sure how to read this thing to be honest anymore, but the main point is that the more journals were on Twitter or and, and on social media, the their impact factors increased and their they had more interaction with readers and engagement. And I would suspect that the same would hold true for an individual. Um, do I think Twitter is better than LinkedIn for radiologists? I that's a good question. I think LinkedIn, if you're looking for job opportunities is a useful way to do that. Job opportunities are ways to engage in a real professional relationship with the individual or organization. But if you want to broadly expose the world to your work, I would guess that Twitter or X is a little bit better, but I don't have any data off the top of my head to substantiate that claim. It's just my personal experience. Great question. So, so I guess, yeah, as I kind of alluded to, yes, these previous slides and this study pertain to the effect of social media on the strength of medical journals. But it's for me, it's kind of easy to draw a correlation and kind of an analogy to how that may, uh, a similar link would exist for radiologists individually in their social media presence. So would an active social media presence increase the impact of your research efforts? It's a great question. All of these are great questions, something to think about. So developing and building upon research partnerships. So AZMed is a French company um, that has a fracture detection tool known as Revolve, which um, I have been fortunate to work with and perform some collaborative research with. And just following them and them following me kind of gets us both exposure to what the other party is all about, what, they're, what they have coming up in the pipeline. And so it kind of also creates a profile for yourself in which industry may interact with. In addition, it's a great way to lift up your colleagues, right? So I've got colleagues in my department, I've got residents, trainees, they're publishing research. It's not all about me, you know, we are here, we're a community and we wanna lift up others. So I, you know, just by doing a retweet of someone else's work or accomplishments, can help to increase the exposure of that individual in a substantial, meaningful way. You know, so it's kind of like sponsorship um, in that we can increase the exposure of our colleagues' work to the world. And you would hope that you know they would do the same, maybe if the opportunity calls for it. But it, you know, really, it's about lifting up others in in your circle and trying to to increase their exposure and hopefully their success in their professional careers. So getting promoted. So as a junior faculty, getting promoted is an interesting concept. Um, so part of the um, process of getting promoted, and this is straight from my department, but uh, generally it's a um, common uh, theme from department to department, but you need to get people uh, who you've never personally worked with. There's this arm's length rule, um, basically, where you can't have like published with them, really. You can't have worked with them. Uh, in your department, you can't have trained together, essentially. Um, so you they have to satisfy this arm's length rule. And you have to convince these people or get these people to want to write you a letter of recommendation saying that, yes, indeed, this individual is an active participant in academia and has contributed substantially to education or clinical work in a substantial way on the national or international scale. So how does one convince other people to do that if you've never worked with them or co-published. And I think going to conferences is a very important thing to get exposure. Publishing work at conferences or manuscripts is an important thing to get exposure. People will recognize your name. But if you're also on social media, I think that just amplifies or helps them to recognize your name when they see your article or when they see your abstract, they can link it to this person who they have a pre-existing knowledge of from social media. So, I mean, think of how many articles you've read, or how many abstracts you've seen, and how many names can you recall from those articles or abstracts that 
you don't you couldn't connect in some other way to social media you know so i just think it's easier for people to connect the names on these various publications peer reviewed publications if they have a pre existing knowledge of that person and social media is a great way to develop that pre existing reputation and knowledge um, so to be outside the university, but preferably not outside, outside the academy, this is that arm's length rule. Um, so these things all violate that arm's length requirement, serving as a supervisor, being supervised, uh, close familial relationship, being a formal departmental colleague, colleague within the past seven years, um, having close research collaboration, co-authoring with a candidate in the past seven years. So all of these are challenging things. I mean, this excludes a lot of folks, you know, that you that may want be willing to write you a letter. Um, so it's maybe a little bit easier to capture folks um, if you have a pre-existing social media presence. These things do not violate this requirement. So having conversations, participating on a panel or committee with a candidate, uh, inviting the candidate to present a paper at a conference, presenting a guest lecture, just various things. This is our department. So social media and radiology overview and use, usefulness of online professional uh, social media profiles. And this is a quote directly from this article by Omar Awan and Bradley Spieler et al. That junior faculty often struggle with opportunities to present their work at the national level. They sub shoulder substantial clinical load, reducing their ability to conduct research. And strategic use of social media can shine a light on the scholarship and expertise of an individual, thus building their reputation and network. So basically, that's, you know, I agree with them on this. And I hope that this talk so far has convinced you in some fashion that this is real. And there's no, you know, there's nothing wrong with self-promotion and promoting other individuals whom you're familiar with on social media um, to increase their exposure. So, you know, I'm just a guy, just want to be very clear about that. I'm just a dude in Northeast Ohio who's a musculoskeletal radiologist. Yes, I have the social media profile and some, a following, but I'm just a dude, right? So these are a bunch of well-known radiologists who I feel that, you know, who follow me or have at some point that I feel that I have no business having a social media following. So Dr. Morrison was past president of SSR. Uh, Donna Blankenbaker is current president of SSR. Obviously, uh, Cookie Menias, uh, Dr. Menias is the professor of radiology and editor of radiographics. Uh, Soterios is a uh, well-known musculoskeletal radiologist. Ali Germazi, also a well-known musculoskeletal radiologist. Alini Serfati is the president of uh, radiology in Rio de Janeiro. And then a musculoskeletal radiologist, and Jan Fritz, who's division chief of MSK at NYU. Very good guy. So in general, the point is to convey that you can expose yourself and your work and your accomplishments to, to folks that you may not otherwise have a exposure to or network with um, unless you've worked with them or know them from other ways, but it's just a way to kind of present what you're all about to, a, to individuals who are relatively advanced and accomplished in their careers, which can be potentially useful to you and you never know what will occur, what can happen, or where these connections may arise. But I just mean to convey, this was like when I was a fellow first year attending, I was, just, I mean, I'm still a nobody, but I was even more of a nobody then. So I just want to convey that. So outside of UH, here's a perfect example of you never know what's going to happen. So Dr. Jan Fritz and NYU group, they developed this really cool, rapid um, MR technology where you can basically do what historically has been a 20 minute knee MRI in you know, five or 10 minutes, depending on how fast you accelerate the sequence. And this is just an example of showing you know, how you know, equivalent the image quality may be to a conventional um, fast spin echo MRI. So, you know, this is something I commented on that this is impressive, you know, love to, you know, this is a great contribution to the community and, you know, patients hate being in this closed loud donut for 20 minutes. And so if we can provide a more comfortable atmosphere while increasing the throughput and increasing access to MRI by opening up more MRI spots, so this is a very substantial contribution and this is awesome. And so Dr. Fritz responded, thanks to me, always happy to help and share protocols. So from this in basic interaction, eventually Dr. Fritz came and gave grand rounds to our department. And we subsequently purchased this said uh, tool 
and he was happy happy to share his protocols with us to allow us to not have to reinvent the wheel and to um, kind of be able to implement this in our clinical atmosphere um, without too much effort. Another thing is like building a network within your community, right? So we have physicians with whom we work within our community, um, within our hospital, and this is a way to develop partnerships and show them, you know, what you're all about. So Dr. Mangala and Dr. Rothermel are um, oncologists, medical oncologists and surgical oncologists um, within our department and sarcoma tumor board. And this is a way for us to follow each other and kind of see what each other is all about and maybe find ways that we can collaborate on research. Maintaining connections. So these are all residents, co-residents, former co-residents that I've had. And it's a good way for us to network and keep in touch with each other um, or former attendings, Dr. Galani is the chair of radiology at University of Michigan. So just a way for us all to be able to see what everybody's doing when we're not in the same geographic region any longer. So finding your voice, branding, right? So what is your brand? Brand is basically some of the ideas and messages you convey. Okay, so and your social media presence is a reflection of what you want people to think of you. So for me, that's someone who's like kind of funny, casual, yet professional. I value medical education. I, I enjoy what I do and I love Cleveland sports. So that's like, that's what I'm putting out there. And so you want to be somewhat thoughtful. And I don't think it has to be super like completely professional. I think something that increases and drives engagement just anecdotally is when you give the world a little taste of who you are in addition to your professional work, right? So like, who am I interacting with? Like, it's a real person with a real thing. So like, I love Ultimate Frisbee. I love Cleveland. That's why you know, I'm wearing my Cleveland, Ohio sweatshirt. Um, you know, so yes, I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist. Yes, I'm an educator. Yes, I know a thing or two about how to read an MRI, but I'm also just a regular person who loves Cleveland and sports and uh, and ultimate Frisbee. And that's something I tried to convey. And I'd like to keep it light and fun and engaging, but professional. So here's my pro tips from an amateur, or these are pro tips from an amateur. Post image rich content and interesting cases. This is based off of an article in CPDR, um, a study using the Twitter handle at CTSS revealed that 910 tweets, news links garnered the fewest engagement when they went back and looked at their tweets, whereas case images ha had the highest engagement. And we can see that here depicted on this graph, 165 for case images, illustrations, very important, 136, scroll through videos, 125, but slide images, uh, case question videos and educational links, news links, far fewer. Okay, so the more image rich content you can post, the more likely folks will interact. Here are some hashtags, which is a means by which you can categorize content or follow categorized content. Hashtag MedEd, hashtag Rad Leaders, hashtag Twitter IR, Twitter IR, hashtag FOMRAD for free educational resources, hashtag RadRes for radiology residents, and hashtag MSKRad. Here's another radio, big list of radiology tag ontology. Just leave this up here for a second. JACR 2016, Hawkins et al. Things that you may want to use. MSK ultrasound, if you want to interact with John Jacobson, for example. So here's a bunch. Nikhil Ramaya is an oncologic imager in our department. So here are some oncologic imaging hashtags that you may use to interact, particularly if it's like screening or diagnostic exams related to a specific cancer. These are ways in which you may uh, garner some interest and engagement with these various communities. I'll leave that up here for a second too. So more tips. You want to have separate accounts for personal and professional use. I tend to not mix them because it can blur your message. I just have a professional one on X or Twitter. Um, I don't use it for personal reasons. I do follow the Browns and I may pre like tweet a Browns thing or something, but I'm not generally tweeting much more outside of my professional work. You want to review your hospital social media policies just to make sure you're in line with your hospital, the institution that you're with. Uh, you don't want to say things like a date or like I read this MRI today or I read this MRI last week. Again, avoid negative interactions for those with those who have opposing views. It's not worth getting into, you know, um, 
battles with people over social media. And tweet chats, I think, are useful ways to engage and learn about a topic. Commercial breaks on the couch are perfect for this. There's being at RSNA, you can engage with people in person. It's fun, but it can be exhausting. But social media tweet chats is a way to sit on your couch during Monday night football if there's a tweet chat going on or whatever you're watching on TV and engage while you're doing other things in hopefully a less um, demanding way. And here's me with my dog participating in a tweet chat. I probably should not have been when I was, should have been probably looking outside this window, but what can you do? Here's another tweet chat, JACR, and I was here to join the tweet chat. And it was about failures and I've normalizing failure within the imaging community. So don't include patient identifiers. Here's our department's acceptable work-related uses of social media, recruitment, networking, creating and participating in affinity groups. And what can administrators do to increase social media use? So administrators, you want your faculty maybe to increase their social media engagement. So it's hard to do it. Um, it you know, people don't want to do it sometimes at home because you don't want to blur the lines between work and home. So lack of time can be a barrier. And um, you may suggest uh, having one person in the department to, or in the, each division to be the social media liaison. You may consider giving some dedicated time for social media engagement. You can, you can incorporate it into the compensation model to reward people, a carrot, for example, to, for engaging in social media. So what do these things even look like? Here's what mine looked like. It's not much different, maybe a big different background picture. And here's what these various tweets and retweets might look like. So I'm not gonna go through the step-by-step -step tutorial, but how to send a tweet, you can find it online on the Google. And that's really all I have for you. So I appreciate everyone's engagement and enlightening questions. And hopefully if nothing else, I've convinced you today that Twitter and social media can be a useful tool for you, no matter what stage of your professional career, whether you're a med student or a resident or a faculty, and you can both learn about the world. You can learn about disease entities. You can get help. You can educate the masses. You can foster mentorship experiences, and then you can share your work and research and develop a network that may be fruitful to you in future situations that you cannot foresee today, but participating is a way to build this network for a time where it may, may be fruitful to you. So I appreciate your time. And again, appreciate our friends at Modality um, for hosting, and I'm happy to take any further questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Faraji. Yeah, we will open the floor to questions and those can come through the Q&A feature, please. Um, I'll take the one that just came in. How can I get access to the presentation and recording? If you registered for this event, we will email you a replay link when that is ready. So. Yeah, and then I think this one I answered, what is the most effective social media that could help in more communication? And I'm going to answer that live. And basically, you know, my answer I think is X and this um, and Twitter. Um, but I'm sure Instagram is another means by which to do so. Facebook also, but probably less impactful. But again, this is all anecdotal. But it is my experience that X and Twitter is the most common way to interact. How can places like Modality uh, support RADs on social media and, and help foster that community? Any tips there? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think um, following Modality on X and Twitter has been an uh, exceptional uh, thing to do because you get information about webinars such as today's, about other informational um, webinars, um, whether scientific or non-interpretive like today's talk, but in addition, just being informed about educational resources that exist in the world out, um, and what are the developments and modality, which is a, which is a useful educational resource. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, ways that you are already engaging at modality with the community to share the free and paid resources which you have um, to increase engagement and the education of folks in the radiology community has been excellent. 
Well, I think if there's no more questions, we could probably wrap up. Thank you so much again for your lecture and for everybody for participating. This has been really awesome. And you can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous Noom conferences by creating a free MRI online account. We'll also send this replay link out via email very soon. Be sure to join us next week on Wednesday, December 13th at 12 p.m. Eastern for a lecture entitled Contrast Enhanced Mammography, Time for Implementation with Dr. Jordana Phillips. You can register for this free lecture at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Dr. Faraji, thank you so much again. We loved having you here. We love working with you and have a great day. Thank you. Take care.